Here we are, fresh off the island. Fresh, fresh off the island. It's October 11th, the year 2022. Welcome aboard, everybody. You're listening to the Crushing Iron Podcast, and this is episode 624. 24, yep, 624. Fresh, fresh off the island with a little bit of sunburn, at least, well, more of a windburn for those of us in the Midwest as it's cooling off a little bit. I was your uh, flight. You out. <laughs> Do what? I was your flight. Oh yeah, you know me. Like I'm, I'm a, I'm what they call a, a jet setter. I, I put, I probably put in a couple million miles a year on my uh, frequent flyer card. No, hey, yeah, listen, I the mileage to me. If I get the next time I get on an airplane, I don't, I don't know when it's gonna be. It could be next year, but who knows? But that's that's gonna take a lot of prep. That's gonna take a very heavy anxiety, panic-driven training block for me to get on the plane. And I, and I feel like you, it might be a block that you and I have to share. Uh, but uh, hope you guys all enjoyed. It was a huge weekend, uh, a giant weekend, actually, I think, for the sport. We'll go into a lot of that today. Um, obviously, we had the Ironman World Championships this last weekend. Uh, two, the first time, it was a two-day event. It was back in Kona for the first time since 2019, as, as you and I have both said since basically 2020. Um, I'll believe it when I see it in terms of when they, when they go back to Kona, how things are, uh, I got a lot of feedback from, from people who were there spectating from people who were racing. We had, uh, men racing on both days and we had a couple of close friends that were racing on Thursday. Uh, so a lot of feedback for, again, from people on the ground, just kind of watching and giving their overall vibe. Uh, cause listen, it was, it was a big to do about this whole two day event. We'll get into that today in uh, in depth, uh, and kind of go over our thoughts of from the men's race and the women's race. But if it's your first time tuning in, let's welcome you. Uh, we appreciate your time. We know you have quite a lot of options in the triathlon podcast universe and just podcasts in general. Your time is very valuable. So we appreciate you tuning in today. We cover it all. We do swim, bike and run specific podcasts. We do race recaps and also race previews. But for the most part, Mike and I as coaches, athletes, best friends, we just sit back, relax, have an open, honest discussion about what we're going through, not just as human beings, but as uh, coaches and athletes ourselves. We also talk a lot about what our own athletes are going through. Mike and I both work with a wide range of athletes all across the globe from beginner level triathletes looking at their very first 5K uh, or sprint all the way up through elite level amateurs trying to get back to Kona or, and everyone in between and from all over the world. Uh, we use the feedback loop we have with them uh, via training peaks, text, uh, text messages, emails, and the like to drive the discussion of the day. Uh, we frequently also utilize our Facebook group. Uh, you can search that on Facebook again, Crushing Iron Group. Answer one simple question and let you right in. Outstanding community, great people, and, an, and a really unbelievable resource, especially if you're a beginner, but also if you are a, a seasoned veteran. Uh, it's a great group. Uh, and again, uh, it's kind of the same level athletes in there from beginners all the way up through Ironman age group champions. Um, so uh, be a part of that group uh, and be a contributor. Don't be a lurker. Uh, participate because honestly, like there's, it's a confusing sport. Uh, there's a lot going on. Swim, bike, run, nutrition, transitions, what race to choose, you know, how tr- how's your training go? Then you got gear and you got the tech. So it's a lot. Uh, frankly, it's too much, uh, but that's one of the reasons why we have that group. So you can use that resource and hopefully simplify things to uh, make your uh, journey a little more enjoyable. Um, we'll go in there frequently, maybe once a month. I guess it doesn't def- that's not defined as frequently, uh, but at least once a month and do a QA. and a But that's it. Uh, we don't do sponsors. We definitely don't do ads, but we do have an agenda. And that's to keep you happy and healthy in your endurance sports journey. Mm-hmm. And uh, boy, what a weekend, huh? Uh, like I said beforehand, I actually watched all day on Saturday. Most of it. I went out for a run on the bike. But what do you think? What a race, huh? Listen, first off, I'm incredibly impressed you watched the whole thing. Yeah. Um, you, that, that's definitely not like you. I Listen, I... I mean, I'll be honest. I mean, I think if we've we've said this. I mean, I've said that, and I, and I still stand by the fact that the Ironman World Championship should rotate. Um, I just I just think it should. Um, I think it's I think it's fair, but I think the distance and and I heard this from a lot of people both that that we had we had three athletes participating, we had three athletes go and spectate, and then we had some other good friends that were racing, and you know, I think that the general sentiment for the staging, right? We'll kind of get, get into the whole format first. We're going to go into the recap of the, of the women's race and the men's race and maybe some key takeaways and just observations. But, you know, I, I'll be honest, even for me, the, the distance you know, distances in time, right. From, from when we last got to watch Kona and people got to go and be there. Mm-hmm. I, I think people forgot 
right? Like, you know, the, the longer you're away from something, the, the, you know, you tend to not think about all the good things and you kind of just kind of maybe drum up or think of, you know, alternative ways. And, and again, I still think that the world championship should rotate. I think they should rotate every four years, but I think they should keep a race in Kona and let a regular age group athletes race, uh, on the course who maybe never have a chance to qualify, but the magic that is there, the energy that is there. I mean, just from watching it on Thursday, because uh, women's women, women's race on Thursday, it's just a special place, you know. And I think it's special for a lot of reasons. One, because we'd associate the Ironman World Championships with Kona because it's been, you know, pumped out year after year, and that's that's all we know, right? All we know is Kona. We've seen the, you know, the the NBC specials, which is what got a lot of people into the sport. You know, the special interest stories that they do. You know, m- most people don't really care much about the pro race. They care about, you know, the special interest stories. Which, again, like I I, I get it. It's what moves the needle. It's what grows the sport. Um, the two day format, you know, I'm a fan of it. Um, in some ways, you know, I, I, I get, you know, and having thought about this, you know, you and I talked before air, just how deep and insanely fast, like the age group, the age group fields are like, you know, you, you've got these good buddies and friends that you think are like the best on the planet. And then they go to Kona and you realize that like there, they're like maybe middle of the pack you know, or like right. barely scraping like the top 10. It's like, it's just crazy. And so, yeah, I've, I've kind of been against the, I'm not against the two day format because even for talking to females that were kind of, eh, I don't really get the big, you know, hoopla about women having their own day after they raced, they said, they all said they loved it. They all said they loved just racing with other females for a lot. And, and I get it. You know, it's, and I think there's a, there's, it was a good thing that there's now separation the days because what you always have is, you know, females will complain about the men and the men will complain about the women. I mean, this is just the circle of life. Right. And so I, I do think, and especially for the pro women, not to have to deal with, you know, back of the pack pros that are men. And then also front of the pack age groupers that would probably beat, almost all of the the female pros, you know, for, for the most part, except for maybe the top 10. So from what I heard, I thought it was awesome. I thought it was great to have two days of television to watch. It's obviously great for sponsorship. Um, I'm not huge on the amount of people, like 5,200 people got to participate in the world championships mm. um, versus when it used to be like half that or less than half. And, and so it's, it, it's a tough call to me in terms of, you know, the the calling it a world championship, which is also kind of like the same thing when the major league calls theirs the World Series. Right. It's like, you know, we just we, we name things world championships just because we kind of can. Um, but it's but I do think if both men and women, it does open up additional opportunities for people who are so close to the top. Right. Um, to go into a deep field and participate. So I, I got great feedback from, again, athletes that were there. Yes, they all think it's too crowded. Yes, they all think it's too expensive. Uh, but would they go back? Yes, <laughs> they would all go back. They'd all do it again. Uh, now, do I think that's super sustainable over the long term? No. And, and while you're going to, you know, while you can read and always look up, you know, negative comments about, you know, uh, you know, restaurants and, and people in the hospitality industry or businesses that were disrupted. You know, I, I, you know, you, you can read that because the people who are who are disgruntled are going to be the ones that are loudest always. But I, I compare that a lot to how I compared things in 2020 and 2021. People who are complaining and lamenting about their, you know, their businesses going out of business, you know, they they weren't being creative on how to make things work because the businesses that were there that chose to like kind of get creative and make things work, they probably they made an absolute killing <laughs> with how many people were there. You know, they were open 24-7. I mean, you, I, I would have to imagine some of those restaurants that chose to stay open and just do and, and kind of go the extra mile, they probably made more in those two or three days, or the four or five days, right? Because that's how long people were there. More than they do in, in, in months sometime, right? And that's a way to think about it. You have to think about how I can pay, you know, my my monthly rent on this for four months, just in these four day spans. So people suck it up or they don't, but no, I thought the format was great. I loved watching it both days. Cause you, cause again, you know, people always complain too about, you know, why don't you, why don't you share the share camera time with the men or, or why don't you share camera time with the women? We don't have to go back and forth. The women got it and then the men got it. And I think it was awesome. Mm. Well, I, I see what you're saying. I personally think as uh, I mean, like, like you said, I, I rarely watch the whole thing anyway. And now you're dragging me over two days. And uh, there's always a thing I always used to remember. It was like, if you have a, you, you, you have a one great event instead of two 
half good. You know what I mean? So like, I think for me personally, it's like, it makes more sense to just, you know, make it one big deal. And I agree with what you're saying. I mean, there's 5,200 people there. That's a little bit extensive. I mean, obviously this is about, I guess, you know, getting more people there and making more money and which, which, you know, you can't argue with that. But for me as a world championship, if you're really going to have it that, you know, it's like, you know, March Madness isn't 300 teams get a chance at it. You know, um, you kind of whittle it down and then you have the best of the best. And for me, I, I just like the excitement of both. You know, I don't, I guess I don't really quite understand how it would be such a problem to race against men if, if you're a woman. I don't know. But for me, I like the whole, let's, let's watch it on one day and do that. I mean, Thursday, I don't know. I, I see, I see both ends. And, and I, I think the, the main issue for me is that the coverage is so piss poor. I mean, honestly, like I'm, I'm going to write into Ironman, I think later today and see if you and I can pay to be the commentators next year for the Ironman World. <laughs> that would be just, that's like the Manning brothers or something. Yeah. I mean, it, but it would, but there's, I mean, and we're not the greatest, but we would be sig- a significant upgrade. It's God awful listening to Michael Lovato and D degrees. It's, it's, it's horrendous. And Andy Potts was awful to listen to <laughs> the, the best. Per- he was horrible. He was absolutely horrific. The best person to li- and Greg Welch, like I don't understand everybody's fascinated. He was he was awful too, terrible. The only person that was even ha- was re- was actually really really good was Rennie. She was awesome. Mm. She had good insight. She knew what she was talking about. She didn't talk around in circles. And if you ever ever heard her husband, obviously he couldn't because he was racing. But he's also awesome. Like get actual in like good athletes that are participating now that can actually carry on a conversation and give good. It was just it was stupid. Like it was. They're horrific to listen to. I don't know why they keep getting renewed to do it, but it's awful. They need younger, fresher, more interesting people to do this feedback, talk about strategy and not and not saying fucking Morton moves every two seconds. Like it did. It sounded like an advertisement, like a 60-word advertisement with six words of an actual race update. It was just horrible. So they can't do that well. So then, they, you know, the camera angles, they can't add things like add cool things, you know, like how fast like a Tour de France does things like they, they they can project like, you know, the watts they're putting down, the time gaps. Right. They can do all that on the screen. They can do um, miles per hour, how fast they're going, what the gradient is like. Do stuff like that. Keep us engaged. Stop talking about, you know, Gatorade and, and Morton and, and Hocus like. No one gives a shit. Okay, we want to talk. We want to hear about the race. We want to be educated. We want to hear about race strategy and these people and their background and their and their training. Not this. Just it. It was awful. It just really was. It was. It was absolutely terrible huh. to listen to. Uh, and, no, it's it's interesting to hear you say that because I obviously when you're saying it now it makes more sense to me. I was just I don't think I was paying attention as closely and I, and I think a lot of times, but I did notice. It was, you know, the advertising part of it is just like, what the hell? It just gets to be so much. Um, and I, I can't, I, I was, <laughs> it's just interesting to hear you say that. Cause I, I totally agree with what you're saying um, from that perspective. And the whole thing about, you know, like just simple things. Like I was trying to figure out where people were at what mile. And they always have the, I, I don't understand why they ever do this, but they track like the whole mi- mileage of the whole day, you know, like they add the swim. And so, you know, on the run you're at mile or, you know, it's one thirty three. And like, I never know what that means. You know what I mean? That's always like the highlighted number too, instead of, I mean, I know it's there and you can find it, but to me, I love what you said about the, the gradients. And I'm always wondering how fast they're going. I mean, I think that's like, you know, very common for most people. Maybe it was there, but I just, I never really realized how fast the, the cyclists were going half the time. And I think those things are definitely more interesting. Yeah. I mean, like, I, I just, I want to, I want to see those details. Like I want to hear about those things. I want to hear about wheel choices and what they're, I mean, like talk about some of the more gear stuff, just stop talking in circles. It, and so to me, like, you know, they, they already can't do coverage correctly on two days, which again, maybe that's, maybe that's more of a vote to do it on one day, you know, yeah, right? get it down. To, that's the thing, right? Yeah, it, it, yeah, exactly. And so I, I don't know, you know, again, it's, you said it, Ironman is not a distance, it's a business. And, you know, so the amount of money they're getting from TV viewership and, and ads, 
And then also the amount of money that they're getting doubling the amount of people participating. And while I think, I think it's great because everything new and shiny is, is usually good, but you know, you continue to double the field in, in, in Kona, then at some point it's not going to feel like Kona. Um, because you know, it's not going to be as mesmerizing and, and, and almost impossible. It's been, you know, cause here's my thing is like impossible is a good thing. Making everything possible is not that great of a thing. Yeah. I, I think that's incredibly overrated. Like how you got to make everything, everything possible. And I'm like, that's not true. Right. That's like, because making everything possible just means we lowered the standards. And, and, and that's become like a huge symptom of society is like participation ribbons and let's lower the standards to make, you know, everyone feel better all the time. And, you know, we have to invite more people. It's not about inviting more people. It's not about equality. Okay. It's not about equal representation. It's about more dollars. And that's what it's about. And, but it's also at the same time, it's, it's, it's also because an Ironman can tell you all they want to. It's about, it's about women for try. And it's about, it's about more females. No, it's not. It's about more females going so they can pay money. Like that's what it's about. And because the women for try from women for try has done nothing for the sport except for add additional slots to world championships at races. That's it. That's it. And, and I'll tell, I'll tell you this right now, Chelsea Sodaro winning the Ironman world championships as a mother will do more in that one day than women for try has done since their, since their actual inception. Right. From from showcasing her and what she was able to do on that day. And then all, and obviously the post race coverage. So it's it's about money. But again, it's, at some point, like you, it tends not to not to be it, it's listen. Kona could end up being the way we all kind of feel about 70.3 worlds. Now, when I got into the sport, 70.3 worlds, you had to you had to have your best race of your life. Right. And you saw somebody with a 70.3 world's jacket or backpack on or, or hat. And you're like, man, they might like, that's, that's awesome. Mm-hmm. Right. It was clear water. Then it was in Vegas and they started rotating it. It was so hard to get to. Like, I remember even back when I was, you know, like, you know, kind of fast, I was always like five, six slots away. And I was like, man, I would love to qualify for that. And then it's become easier and easier and easier and easier with roll downs going into the thirties and forties and fifties. And then it's kind of just kind of lost. And then I've qualified, I think three times now, and I'm not gone any of the time. I mean, half that's because I don't fly, but still it's, it, it kind of loses the luster. And, and even with Kona the last two years, like they, they threw a hundred extra slots, you know, it's uh, at Chattanooga. They threw extra slots at Ironman Coeur d'Alene in 21. So you got people, in age groups that normally have three now have 20 and that are like an hour and a half behind the winner of the age group qualifying for Kona, you know, and, and, and listen, I'm sure there's some, there, there's a few positives there, but we keep doing it. And it is going to, it is going to lose its luster. It is going to lose like the special, like the, the, the specialness, if that's even a word that is Kona. That is the Ironman world championships. Um, because you can't lower the standard, you know, if you, if you're going to make it equal, then make it equal, but don't, do it by adding a hundred, you know, like, you know, in, in my opinion, minimize it and double the entry fee. That's it. S- s- simply double, you know, make it equal and, and go back to 2,500 and double the entry fee. Cause don't tell me the people who are spending 12 grand to go, aren't going to spend 13. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like if that's what you're really worried about, it's worry about the dollars and still let them race on both days. Right. And don't have it so effing congested. I mean, like you and I were talking before we went on air about one of our guys that was there who's, you know, top of the top 10 overall in in big time races. And when I was scrolling through to find the splits on the, on the um, bike split, the first, I think it was like the first five miles, he was 15 minutes behind the lead. That's it. 15 minutes from the lead out of the water from it. And he was 330th. (laughs) Yeah, it's, or, it's something like that's not the exact number, but but the thing is, is like if you went to to thirtieth, that person was only like four minutes ahead. That's just how absolutely congested the it's a draft fest. Is one hundred percent a draft fest? Like, and I think people like think like the Kona bike course is hard. It's not easy, but they had the best conditions ever. The run course is the one that eats eat your lunch. Um, but it's a huge draft fest because there's so many pieces you're making even easier, even faster. And they had great conditions. So, I mean, it was, and, and there's, it's always a hard day in Kona because it's so effing hot. But I, I just, again, like, I think that there's, there's gotta be a way to preserve 
at the core of what it was, what's it supposed to mean to be in a world championships. If you're going to call it that and you're going to mean it, then you got to mean it. And you can't just continue to lower the bar and lower the bar and lower the bar for both men and women. You know, like I said, they, they did it two years ago and they, they tossed a hundred slots at Coeur d'Alene, you know, because they needed to fill, you know, Ironman St. George and everyone deferred to, to Kona this year. And you're like, that's ah, just like, like, you see guys that you beat and you're like, ah, oh, you went to one race and you got extra slots. Like in my opinion, just make them all even, you know, stop adding in a hundred slots at Chattanooga because you're low on registration, you know, mm-hmm. to bump it up, quit throwing slots at races and calling them tri club championships or North American championships because you got low registration. If you add more Kona slots, it's just, it's, it's advertisement. And I, I think it's the wrong way for the sport to go grow when I think it's proven when you watch the professionals that we don't need, we don't need that for the sport to grow. Like you just, you need good examples and great performances from professionals to make you want to do it. And in the company in general is, is, I mean, Ironman is what they're, they make their money from age groupers. They lose money on pros. And so, I mean, more people will be more in, or be interested after watching and hearing about Chelsea star or Gustav Fieden. You know, we had our two first rookie winners when basically that was like unheard of. It's a new generation. It's a new time. So again, like I'm not for lowering the standard, I think it's. I think the two day event is fine, but I, I'm not a fan of the 5,200 to 6,000 people that are going to be at a quote unquote, you know, world championship. You know, if you think about the amount of people that 5,200 to make, that's two sold out Ironman events total of people who qualify for the world championships. It used to be barely even one, and now you've doubled it. And so, I, yeah, I, I think. I think there's, again, with all things, there's things to love. There's things not to love. Um, but, you know, I'm not in charge, and that's probably for a reason. <laughs> well, you mentioned um, something about back to the actual race, the draft fest uh, out on the bike because of so many people. So I, I have something I want to – I was kind of interested to hear your opinion on with regard to the swim. And that's the first – I mean, that what, 20 people got out of the water at the same time? And – I thought that was really interesting. And then, of course, one of the things they mentioned was like, oh, this is going to be, we're going to have to keep an eye on who's going to get a penalty here. <laughs> because it was like, I've never seen, what, do you have a thoughts on, I mean, normally, I mean, maybe I don't watch as much as everybody, obviously, but it seems to me like there's usually one or two people kind of out there just getting out of the water first. And then there's about seven people. And But this time it was like everybody was there. Is that like, you think a strategy that was going on down there? And then- the other thing, one of the most interesting parts of this race for me was the um, the bike position of these guys. Coming mm-hmm. up. It was like I was seeing, was I was it my imagination or was I seeing a version of the tabletop? You, you saw you saw a lot of, <laughs> of both things and like the, listen, this is going to be a two part cast. We're going to finish this on Thursday because I have so much to say about all of this. All right. What you, you you brought up the men's race and you and what you usually see in the start of the swim is what you saw in the women's race. You saw Lucy Charles Barkley gun it, mm-hmm. right? That's her thing. She wanted to go wire. She figured, what the hell? This is my this is my thing. I'm gonna slam it. I'm going for it. Okay. Mm-hmm. And she held on and, and wasn't too, wasn't too far off from winning the thing. Right yeah. after a after a broken you know a broke a fracture a hip fracture where it almost ended her career. And again, she was one of my favorite. Uh, the, my two favorite interviews were were arguably honestly hers and I'm not a huge fan of hers, but her, her tears again were for, were just from how grateful she was to be back on the starting line. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course you got the commentators like, yeah, that's probably a little bit from getting second place and a little bit from, you know, the, I'm like, no, it was all, it's all about gratitude being grateful. She was back, but she gunned it. What the, what the men's race. And I love that. You got a weapon, use it. Usually in the men's race, you've got Josh, Am- Josh Amberger out front. Uh, Sam Laidlo was obviously out there pushing the pace, and you end up getting second place. But you usually have guys like Amberger who chose not to push the pace this year. What did he get, like 30th, something like that? The race, it, I'm going to tell you right now, if Jan Ferdino and Alistair Brownlee would have been the start list, Sam Laidlo or Jan wins this race. Because everyone in the men front pack was terrified to push the pace. It's like they had already accepted they were going to lose to either Gustav or Christian. Neither one of those guys had any business making the front pack in Kona. No on, non-wetsuit. Neither one of them. They, Brownlee would have gunned it. And Sam Layla would have been on speed. That was the largest pack I've ever seen. And I know, you know, you don't cover, watch the pros as much as I do, but that was the largest swim pack I've ever seen mm-hmm. in Kona. Ever. 
and and they just came out of the water together. It, it, it honestly, it made for almost like a very ITU style race that was just longer and more boring because, you know, in, in ITU, they call it, you know, um, shower, dry off 5k <laughs> because they, because they, they swim together, they bike together and then it's who can run the best. And in the same Lalo couldn't quite get off the front. He didn't have uh, anybody to go with him or anybody to really push the pace and really cause any, any giant separation. But those guys never should have been in the front pack. Never should have. And so if you think about if, if Jan and, and Brownlee would have been there, because Brownlee would have just gassed it from the get-go. He would have known that he would need a gap to make separation of force b- both Blumenfeld and Gustav Eden to work really, 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 really hard. Because you saw that in the you saw that in the women's race. Daniela Reef, obviously it was it was apparent on the run she was having a bad day. But you saw in the women's race that she was in the third pack. When she's normally in the second. Now, of course, she was having, I think, a bad day overall, but the distance, I think she was maybe six or seven minutes behind, that is so much time to make up by yourself on the bike. And the fact that you're doing it alone, no one's gonna go help her, right? She's the defending champ. No one's gonna go help Reef. No mm-hmm. one. But she came out of the water with with Anna with Annie Haug and Haug just sat behind her and 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 took a free ride because no one's going to help her, right? And so if you had had Gustav and and Blumenfeld who rode together the entire time, which I'll get to in a little bit, it, it was it it was interesting, but I I thought it was fear based. I, I really did. It was like you know the the, the guys that normally lead out of the world, like yeah, I'm that's not going to do that this year. I'm like, why are you playing for second already? Mm. Like what? It it was it shouldn't have been that way, and that's why like. I love the fact that Lucy Charles gets out there and she just gas. She's like, she knows her strength. You know, she blew Lauren Brandon out of the water, you know, which is also a, a top tier uh, pro um, swimmer. And it was, and it made, and it, and it set a race up. It, you, you're the, you're, you're being hunted, but still like it, it just makes for, it made for really terrible group dynamics because none of those guys could push the, if Brownlee and yawn and honestly, Sam get out of the water in the front, like they, like they would have, if both of them would have gone they would have gapped them by a few. They would have gunned it. And then instead of being able to sit in at fourth and fifth and occasionally leading, you know, like the, like Blumenfeld and, and Gustav, they would have had to really, really work hard. And those guys would have just slammed it. And it would have been really, really interesting. I mean, not to, not to diminish what they did, but it was a different race. Um, and that was, that was one of the things I just think they were, I think they were, were scared. It definitely was missing some of the top tier swimmers, but, but still it was like, you know, <laughs> It was. It was kind of sad to watch. Versus the women, it was just like, I'm, you know, Lucy Jones. I, I might not win, but I'm sure it's all going to act like I can. And mm-hmm. she gunned it. Yeah. You know, and she rode well. I mean, it was. It was the the women's race was significantly more fun to watch for the first hundred and thirty miles than the men's race was, and it's not even really close um, because it was it was actually you know athlete versus athlete you know, trying to make moves. And then you saw it too. Like, you know, you saw the drafting penalties, which again, your pros stop complaining that you want more, you know, <laughs> you want more regulation on drafting. And then when you get drafting penalties, you complain about it. Mm-hmm. You know, that all they wanted the last two or four years, especially the Uber bikers is like, Hey, we need more. We need a, we need a larger draft zone. And we need to be more stringent on it. And then you get pinned. You're like, oh, this is bullshit. <laughs> you're like, well, you, the, the, the markers are on the road. But that also changed the landscape of the women's race. It changed the landscape of the men's race. Um, you know, getting those five minute penalties. It, it's uh, you know, which again, it's kind of one of those. It's such a relative like interpretation of of your visual distance, which again, I think should be could be covered from a technology standpoint. But um, but yeah, I the, I thought the swim was. But it also, to me, the swim showed you that if you don't make the front pack in the swim. Then you then you're then you're then you have a very 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 slim chance to win. I mean the the, the top three winners and the men were all in the front pack: Sadaro, Barkley, and I think Annie. Uh, outside of Annie, those two are in the front pack, and obviously a leader. So you mean you you have to with the dynamics of professional racing, you have to be in that front pack. I mean, I was I like to rib on Sanders, and he had a horrific day sometimes, but the level of swimming has been the bar has been raised. Mm-hmm. The last five years, like if you look at Sanders when in 2017, when he got second, I think he was like 26th out of the water or something, mm-hmm. which isn't bad. He was like, I've got to work on my swim. 
right? He's, he's a guy, just he's like many other age group athletes, which by age group athletes adore him. He's very much kind of like an age group athlete. He's a he's you know a late adult onset swimmer, even though he's a professional, but and he's and he's could beat you know pretty much all age well most age groupers in the pool in open water. He's like I gotta really dedicate myself to to getting better in the pool. And that's what he said for the last five years. He went from being 27th or 26th out of the water when he was second to last. To last. He was last out of the water. Wow. Or one of the like the last two or three. So he's like 45th. Five years later, and all that time, he's more he's more time back. The the level has been raised in the swim. And, and that's been raised because the short course guys have come in there and been like, listen, like you know, we know how to swim. We're complete athletes. And if you want to be a complete athlete too, you better get your ass in the pool, which is a good lesson too to age groupers. Like it, you, and again, if the pros think the swim is important, so should you. Ah, uh, man. This, but it's like they basically could have just started on the bike together without the swim anymore. So I, that's what just, it's just so um, interesting to me to watch that. And I'm watching Lucy Charles and she is going after it. And then I'm watching the men's pack and it did look like they were cruising to me. I don't know. I mean, it, it it's gotten a lot better, but it obviously, maybe it's that thing about everybody's getting better and there's really no separation anymore. And that's, I guess, a big deal. Um, but as I'm watching this race and now I'm thinking about Kona, and so this, you know, I've watched it so many times now, not as much as you, obviously, but now you start to think about that bike course, which is just straight out and straight back. And it's like, mm-hmm. you know, the draft opportunities, or I'm not saying they're trying to draft necessarily. I'm just saying it's almost impossible not to. So that does sort of like start making you wonder is like, is this, really the course it's I mean it's a di- I, that ITU comparison is really interesting to me because it's almost like this the distance is shortening right before our eyes and, and it's becoming a different event whereas if you do a some kind of race where there is turns and hills and all kinds of different stuff like that then it kind of separates people right but in and it's just, you know it's just sort of like more in the idea of a peloton where it's like well if you get up in there you're going to be all right you know and then you'll have a chance on the run. So it's like shortening the race in a way where it's it's taken, if you're going to swim with uh, everybody and be in a pack of 20 getting out of the water, and then you're going to be on the bike with a bunch of people and it's, you know, they're, everybody's pulling each other along, then it just becomes really about the run. And I, I, there's something about that that's kind of, I don't know, kind of a letdown in a way. It was a huge, it was a huge letdown. I mean, and you touched on a lot of things that I totally agree with is, is both – the the women's race is what the men's race usually looks like, mm-hmm. right? And again, I agree that now that you've got so many like short course, you know, guys and girls coming up from from ITU and seventy point three distance racing, there is going to be a bigger front pack. But there was no like some of the guys in the front pack were backstroking to be like, who's with me? Who's with me? Can I push hard? Who's going to go with me? Instead of just like gunning it, mm-hmm. you didn't see Lucy Charles look back. She was like, bye, bye, Felicia, I'm out of here. Like she was gone. Mm-hmm. That's what the men. So the men's race was definitely lacking. Hugely lacking. Some of the some of the alphas, Brownlee, Jan, Gomez, you know, the other IT like that would have just gassed it at the front and been like, we're not gonna look back. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna redline it until we drop you. So you have to swim alone, and you have to swim alone and burn more energy, and then you have to bike alone or get your own group that doesn't have as much firepower. The the other big thing with Cone and the women had harder conditions, which is it's also why I think you had you could see it. The men's race is pretty much crystal crystal clear glass. It didn't. It looked a kind of rolling, but not nearly. The women's you could see the chop yeah. on the water, and it was definitely a slower swim for the women. And also, that also caused a lot of the separation for the women. But the other big, the biggest thing for the on the men's race and, and the women's race really was that there were, it was a low wind day on both days, and and, and low wind means it really favors the the people who are who are not as good at biking because it's not because you can draft and you save so much energy. I mean, you save so much. You have guys that are not willing to work, then you just save and you save and you save and you save on, on days like in Cone that I usually have. There's so many crosswinds that drafting doesn't save you much because you're getting the beating from the side. And that, but that to me, that's also a reason why you should, because the bike course is to me is it's almost impossible not to draft. And that's why you saw some people is that's why you saw nothing in St. George they, to having a technical hilly course to me is so much better because it does cause separation and, and, really requires these athletes to race on their own. 
and, and, and you, again, you saw that a lot more on the women's race. You saw some, some ladies get banged, but, um, there was separation, in the swim, which caused separation on, on the bike. And you had, uh, you had to be smart you, know, you had to work your own plan, but you had to be smart. And that's what you saw. And the, the men's race was just until Laylo finally was like, listen, I, if I'm going to win this race, I got to go. It was interesting to watch. Cause I always got this feeling like, and, and I think they're great for the sport. I think both Gustav Eden and Christian Bloomfield are great for the sport. Um, I thought they thought they were going to win no matter what, no matter who showed up and they could do whatever they wanted to. Mm -hmm. And that proved not to be true. And, and and also say like, as, as in, again, if you don't watch the sport as much as I do, if you go back to the years of Patrick Langa won his world championships, everybody ripped him, ripped him for basically riding behind and working with his quote unquote team, Mm -hmm. um, same sponsorships. And then he would just run his way. Eden and Bloomfield did the exact same thing. (laughs) <laughs> the exact same thing. The exact same thing. They swam together. They rode together. They ran 28 miles together. And you and I talked a little bit about this before on the uh, before we went live. Is you know ever, since since they've both become in these incredible gold you know, Christian Bloomfield gold medalist. You know Ironman World Championship in in, in Saint George. One Ironman caused the medal. Gustav Eden two times 70.3 World Championship. Now the Ironman World Championships in Kona. There was like, oh, well, this the, it's the Norwegian method. It's lactate. It's it's this. They they've got this secret sauce, you know, figured out. They both almost fucking lost <laughs> to mm-hmm. a 23 year old from France, right? Mm-hmm. It was in in who worked by himself the entire day, and you know, outside of a few like a, a small grouping on the bike. It wasn't like they and, and and the bike course was 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 it was perfect for them because it wasn't super wind. The swim was for them, none the none the front time, none the front pack swimmers there. But you know, if, it, to me, it, it's it's about more about two guys because they haven't they haven't replicated it with their women. They've they've done you know pretty decent at other ITU guys, but they haven't developed anybody further. You know, that large to that large scale to, to to say like, oh, it's it's the Norwegian method. They've got it all figured out, and everyone else is playing catch up. Well, Mikkel Eden, you know, Gustav's brother, who is you know a big Norwegian guy, you know, his guys got thirty third and thirty fourth, over an hour behind. You know, and I I think it's more about you know uh, it's about the power of having someone do things with you, right, and support collective strength, right? They've had they've been two guys. They've been best friends for 10 years, training for this day for 10 years. If you had that waking up ready to push you every single day, you mean you, you'd be so much better, right? It's like, it's, it's a collect, it's the collective goal, right? And, and that same thing that you heard that in, in Chelsea Starro's interview, right? It was, it was, she's like, I'm, I don't have a, I don't have a big squad. You know, I, I'm not a, I don't have a big entourage, if you will don't have all this fancy things. I just, you know, my dad sagged every ride for me the last month. You had to have help, you know, help with childcare, you know, and my mom was helping out. My husband's a firefighter. It's, it's, it's like a, it's a blue collar win, which I think resonates with, with everyone else because that's how a lot of age groupers, you know, live, you know, it's, it was, but so it can be done in, and they, so they rode together and then they ran. And I still think they were like, you know, we can just run together and we're going to get first and second no matter what. And then, you had what eight guys on you know break the record basically, and again like a lot of it has to do with the conditions were fast. No one pushed the swim, and then now we've got super shoes that save us minutes. But Gustav finally had to leave Blumenfeld. He went to the med. He went to the the med tent and got attention after he finished. People aren't that far behind. Aren't far behind two guys that have made this their only goal for the past five years. Who who probably don't have girlfriends, who don't do anything but eat, sleep, and train. Mm-hmm. For the rest of us. That's why I love Laidlow. My favorite two interviews are Laidlow and Sadaro. And uh, Louis Charles Barkley, too, even though I'm like a huge fan fanboy of hers. But they, she was just grateful. And and Sam's was just so genuine. He was just like, I can't believe it. <laughs> he was just like, I, I, I can't, I can't. I've been dreaming this since I was six. You know, his dad's his coach. Um, and the other, and, and Blumenfeld was what, a minute and a half from getting caught, you know, from the guy behind him from no one's heard of. I mean, it, it, no one's, no one's, um, you know, impervious to being beaten. And, and so I, I did, I, I thought the conditions were perfect for them to win. I don't see them. I don't see either one of them being a shoe in period, especially when you look at how young the guys are that are coming. I don't see either one of them. Gustav is by far a better Ironman athlete. In my opinion, than Christian is on, on, on the Kona courses. Cause it's so effing hot. Um, 
but no, I, I the, listen, these are wide open and that's why you love them. You know, Jan's going to come back next year. Brownlee, if he can stay healthy for more than five days, he'll be back next year. Hopefully Gomez, younger guys are coming up and it's, it's a new generation. And yes, they, a bunch of them shattered the record and, and drop times and, and the same thing on the, on the women's day. Um, and, but a lot of it's also some, the, the, the conditions were super fast on the bike. They're always hot on the run. Then you got, you know, super shoes make a huge difference. Um, but the, the the sport changed this last weekend, and I think it changed for the better. Um, and that anybody can do anything, you know. And, and the women's race, again, like the, you got Lucy Charles. But yeah, everybody thought Danielle Reaver was going to take it home when she made the last pass with like three miles to go. And she she obviously was having an off day. And then Chelsea Zorro just ran her race and walked the aid stations. Yeah. To stay cool. I mean, like it was, and still ran like the most mind blowing marathon. Her, her, she probably, she executed the best race of, of anyone in the men's and women's field the whole day. Like Lady Lowe probably tell you, he, he couldn't believe he held on that long. Um, you know, his, his race is pretty well executed as well, but she, her race was like perfection, perfection, like down to a T. And, and I, again, I loved the, the blue collar, the nature of, of her work ethic, it seemed, and, and her kind of low key-ness in a sport that's become overly YouTubed and, and advertised and, and glamorized. Interesting, man. Uh, you, you had mentioned, I think, last time or one of the, pa- the past casts is that a lot of these people just know that Kona's the race, so they train for it and they kind of stay out of the limelight and things like that. And, and it's... And it just became so crystal clear to me watching is like, like I said, it's just a different race. And you had what Keenley and O'Donnell were top 10 and probably two of their best races out there or whatever. But it, it just, uh, yeah, you can train for that s- sort of race. It's like a different type of race. than if you do like a St. George or something like that, you can't hide on that kind of course, you know, and that just became like, so obvious to me watching and it's just like it's almost like a different sport in a way when you put it together like that whereas you know you're not dealing with uh hills that can just beat you down and and all this kind of stuff and it's just sort of straight ahead and no turns and does it you know like you can i i just imagine people training in a wind tunnel for this on a trainer you know and it's sort of like instead of riding hills and really becoming a a good bike handler like like does bike handling even come into play out there really you know, it's only on the return trip. Like, you know, when you, when you're going down, they're doing like, you know, 40 plus miles an hour that, that, but like St. George or I mean it, to, if you go back and when Gustav Eden was like a relative, relatively unknown when he won his first world championships at Nice, no one knew who he was, no one. And he won it on a road bike, but he would even tell you that one of the reasons he was able to win is cause he's, he's got unreal bike handling skills. And that mm-hmm. was a super technical sport, you know? And so if you, Again, like, you know, if you, if you take the world championships, again, if you're going to make it a world championships and you're rotated, it's like, you know, you, and that's why like, you know, even things like the Super Bowl, like it's always on fucking turf. Yeah. You know, like you know, what, what if it wasn't, what if it was at, you know, what if it was at Lambeau, <laughs> you know, field, like, you know, it'd be a totally different ball game, you know, but that's, that's, you know, everyone does the safe thing, but think about if you put it on a course like Ironman Frankfurt, right. Or, um, some of the other like super like, or like Placid or, or some of the really, really challenging other courses across the world that don't just lend itself to or like Ironman Wales. That's cool. That's cooler in a much more technical hilly bike ride. Like think about how different the race would look, you know, so if you're going to call it, it's so I do, I think it lends itself to a specific style of a style of athlete, specific style of racing. And obviously I think lends itself to a much shorter, leaner, uh, type athlete, the bigger ones, it's just no matter how big. And I think that was Blumenfeld's deal is like, He's just so stocky. He's not fat. He's just stocky. He's still thin. He's got giant lungs and a giant VO2 max. But I think from you've just got more surface area, bigger muscles. You can't dissipate heat as much. You just get too freaking hot. I mean, Gustav Eden looked like he was jogging to breakfast on like the last 10K. And I'll say this before I forget. If you if you watch the pre-race interviews when they when they interviewed Blumenfeld, and I think this is a great lesson for for everyone in in in, uh, in training, especially age groupers, is they're interviewing Blumenfeld, and he was like, yeah, he said it'll be really, he said he was like, you know, I don't think he said I expect to win, but he pretty much said that. And he was like, yeah, it'll be interesting if Gustav beats me when I've beaten him in training the last two weeks. 
Mm-hmm. And they interviewed Gustav and they because they they heard him say they, they you know, he was like, hey, yeah, Christian has been beating you and in the last two weeks in, in, in training. And he said, well, he said, you know, I am not as you know, I, I don't push myself as hard as Christian because I think he pushes himself too much in training. Um, and I care more about race day and I have something special planned for him the last 10 K. <laughs> and speaking and, of the last 10 K, did you hear his quote? Uh, uh-uh. He says, the last 10K, I was worried about the legend of the island killing me. Oh, yeah. right. Everything was going pretty smoothly until I caught Sam Laidlow. When I passed him, the island really tried to put me down. But I think my hat must have... Wait, my hat? Yeah. yeah, I he's, think, yeah. I think yeah, my he, hat he must fell. be stronger than the legend of the island. I'm not sure if I'm coming back here. That was too hard. <laughs> Yeah. He said the same thing after winning Ironman Florida. They're like, so you, can we see you in Cone? He was like, I don't know if I'm going to do one of those again. <laughs> because <laughs> in, in his hat story, and I don't know if they even like went to this in coverage, but he found that hat in Asia somewhere in like the side oh, of the yeah. road it, before he won his 70.3 world championships and has, hasn't lost wearing it since. Um, and, but he, uh, but he did, he, he saved his, his best quote unquote. He didn't burn his biscuits in training, which is kind of what he said. Christian does. He let him do his thing. Cause it, it, I listened to an interview about a year ago talking about, you know, measuring and effort. And they said, you know, everyone has their default, right? The, the default, if you tell, if you tell him zone two and you tell him to run off field, you know, Johnny's default might be to run low zone three and Jim's default might be to look, to run high zone one. And they talked about Christian and his was that his was, if you give Christian a default feeling, he's usually going to over overrun and override and over swim. And if you tell Gustav, he's going to under swim and under ride and under run. Um, and look like that's okay <laughs> to, to better to come in fresh. Cause he did, he had something for him. That's why I picked him to win. I thought, I thought he, I thought he had it. I thought he was just built for the course. Um, and he did, he came out and he said, you know, I have something for him, especially the last 10 K to have that kind of reserve, especially on a day to day basis. When you're able to check your ego, Every, everyone's got an ego. Blumenfeld's got an ego. So does Gustav, you know, it's like, uh, you know, but to have that, that, that measure of confidence and patience to be like, you know, you can beat me in training and I'm sure you let me hear about it every single day, you know, but all I care about is crossing the tape first. And he crossed the tape and looked like he just went out for like an easy 10K. Walking around, wasn't falling over. I mean, he looked like he didn't do anything. Yeah. I mean, it was really unreal um, to, watch, and to watch him. And Chelsea was the same. You know, she, she crossed the finish line and was like, do 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 you know, I'm going to pick up my kid. I think i got a grocery shopping to do. i got to be at here at 4 o'clock. You know, it's like, it was, it was like nothing ever changed. It was really unreal to watch versus the other ones. And, and I think to me that was the – that showed you the measure of how perfect their execution was. Mm-hmm. You know, you saw laid low. He didn't really collapse as much. Blumen felt like collapses at every event and has to get like medical attention. Lucy was the same way. Annie was the same way. It was like, cause they're, they're done was probably five miles before that. And they were kind of in a dangerous place where those two, <clears throat> they paced it so perfectly they weren't done till they crossed. Nothing, and neither one had an ounce left. But it was, it just showed how perfectly you had to pace it. And and perfect pacing will outdo great fitness and poor pacing every single time. Yeah. Every time. Yeah. It could be every single time. It's a great lesson for age groupers on pacing. That's what I was just gonna say, man. It's like, what does it take? I mean, it's all relative, right? You can't run it or race that fast. But can you, it, with all the training we put in? kind of run it and end it in your own way like that. You know, like I always think about what that would take and what does that mean? I mean, where are we, where are we burning our biscuits? I mean, we think we're not doing it on the bike or whatever. We think we're not doing it on the first part of the marathon, but has any, you know, how many people age groupers finish a race in, you know, what looks like maybe their cruise zone, you know, it may be a 10 minute mile versus what Eden was doing, but I just think that there's something there that we all need to kind of reflect on. You know what I mean? It's like, I think we all, I don't know. We obviously we don't train as much as those people, but we, you know, a lot of us train a lot and you know, by mile three of the marathon, we're walking or whatever it is, you know, it's like, why does that happen? You know, I just think that there's that pacing lesson that you're talking about is, uh, you know, maybe it's an ego check. Um, but 
I mean, it's 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 like you know pulling into the gas station with a tenth of a tank left versus pushing it with your with the you know the truck driver who helped you stop pushing it into the gas station because you ran out a half mile away. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. like the the time you lose doing that versus the time you lose you know cruising in at your normal speed with you know twenty miles left versus zero. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just it, it's such a lesson on pacing and and leading off the bike. You know, in 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 having confidence, you're going to run people down. You know, and, and sticking with your plan. Chelsea's plan was to stop at every aid station and, and, and cool herself off, you know, and, and stay cool, which is, again, like they even said the quote that I think they basically stole from her podcast. But and they said, once you get too hot, it's over. You can't cool yourself down. It's over. And that was her goal, to cool herself off and do everything she could. And it wasn't to just cool herself off. It was to prevent herself from getting so hot that there was no point of return. And, and that, to me, was, was the story of the day. You know, and I think had – had you know there not been some of the drafting penalties it would have looked a lot different but that's every race something happens every race right you you can blame the drafting penalty for the men's the women's race or you know lucy charles was hurt and you know um and, or chelsea wouldn't have won you know or if someone's going to get drafted there's shit happens every race mm-hmm. right daniel was obviously having an off day or was sick or something happened you know so she had a bad day but someone always has a flat tire or, you know, gets, you know, something happens or gets like you know, one of my favorite guys, Braden Curry, he got sick, the flu, the week of the race. He started in it pulling off on the bike. Um, you know, it's like, you know, it, Joe Skipper, who I picked, I think the pick to get a third, he came from like 15th off the bike to fifth, you know, ran his way to the field. I mean, you always see guys like that run. I think they, one of the things they always say in, in Ironman racing is that you don't have to catch people they'll come back to you mm. because if you just run your race and you stay steady and you don't slow down, you're not slow down. will catch everyone slow down. And because everyone just comes back to you, you know, you stay even Steven at nine minute miles. Well, you don't have to catch the guy running eight forty fives cause he's going to go eight forty five, nine, nine thirty, ten, eleven, twelve, 10, 11, 12. And that's so, so relevant on a course and in a conditions like Kona because it's so hot. Once you overheat, it's over. I mean, like, it's it's the pro field. It, it's it's the Ironman race in on the professional field. You see more people walking, more professionals that win races who who won races to get there, walking, and just and just waving the white flag, just waving it. They're like, yeah, we're done. We can't do it. And, and so I do. I think it was. I thought it was really interesting. You know, I I, I will say. I'll say it again. Like I thoroughly enjoyed watching the dynamics played out in the women's race because they all, they all rode and and they all swam and rode and ran for themselves, you know, in there because they wanted, they, they all thought they could win. They all thought they could win. You didn't see that as much from the men. It it was was because Jan wasn't there. Brownlee wasn't there. It was like, Oh, it's, I wonder who's going to win. Gustav and Blue, they're going to be one and two. They're going to, even those probably, "Ah, no one can beat us. We're just going to be one and two. The, they, they got put on notice. They weren't that far ahead. They just weren't in totally different dynamics on a super windy bike. I don't think either one of them win. I'm just, I'm just saying, I don't think either one of them win. I, I, it's just a totally different, the, the field has been raised. The marathon times are going to continue to drop because people are going to continue to get faster and faster and faster. And it's not going to be, you know, this new obsession. There's you know, all these professionals next year aren't going to be going back and, and measuring, measuring lactate. You know, that there was no measurement of lactate in the women's field. You know, it's become the new Norwegian method of obsession. Uh, there was a first and a third in the men's and a 33rd and a 34th. So if you take that average, they're like, what, 10th, 11th, 12th overall? You know, and if you take the two guys, and, and if, again, if you look at the outliers, you had uh, Colin Chartier, who, who won the PTO in Dallas, and you had Lionel Sanders, who's getting the same thing done, the same coach. You know, they've, they've just started, they've been doing this for like the last year. So it's something, it's not some, it's not some new secret sauce, Right. The guys that won it have been doing, have been working on this plan for over five years. Five years ago, they sat down with their coach, Olaf or or Boo, whatever his last name is, and said, um, "Our goal is to win the Olympics and then win the Ironman World Championships." And think about having a guy to do that together with. <laughs> Right. Mm -hmm. For, I mean, you you see like, you know, uh, twins or close brothers that like, you know, that succeed or, you know, uh, the in foreign sports because they they had, they were pushed. They were pushed 
day in and day out for the same common goal. To me, that that's their secret is that they've had each other the same common goal. They've been consistent. They've had a plan to do this for like the last five years. And it's not some secret, you know, lactate data measurement. It's that it's that it's their common, their underlying common goal of, of something that's, that's that they both share together and they push each other every single day for five years. And they still <laughs> didn't blow off the field. Right. They didn't blow everyone's doors off. It wasn't no one even, you know, assumed they were or thought they were going to win until what? The last 4K? Really? You know, and even then, like it wasn't like he blew everybody out of the water. It was just it, it's it's uh there's there's there is no secret sauce. You know, it, it's uh everybody has their own, you know, if you look at the the dis- things that you know Lucy Charles Barkley has at her disposal, like you know, she's not a mom. You know, she's got the Red Bull training center and this like perfect setup in her garage. And, you know, and yeah, she got injured, but the, you know, the girl who beat her and outran her insane, who I think may have been on a regular day, you know, was a mom 18 months ago, has to find childcare, husband's a firefighter, you know, it's like, and then you, you continue to go down the line and down the line and down the line at the, the females. Nothing is foregone. Nothing. And it's going to be like that for a while. And I think that this, you know, we love to be obsessed and, and idolized and the new and improved stuff. And, and that's got to be the way, and there's new this and I'm like, dude, like, you know, it's, it's everyone's obsession with it is, you know, you can obsess over the other stuff first. And if you have a good team around you, you got a good coach, you got a good, you know, good support and a shared common interest and a goal, you're going to succeed. You just are. And, and, and so I, I do, I think it was a, it was both days were amazing to watch and, and obviously since I've only let you get in like five words today, I could talk about this for like five hours. Sorry, buddy. <laughs> it's like, it's all right, there's just, there's just so much to, to take in and, 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 uh, observe. And, and there's always things to, to, I think, observe for age groupers that you can, that you can, uh, you can make from it. But you know, I, the conditions were perfect. That's why you saw such fast times. You got super shoes. You got all these kind of the wind was down. It's just it's a it's a different different game now. But all with with you also have faster. I mean, if if you want to want to run the want to win the men's race, you're gonna have to run the two thirties. Two thirties for a marathon in Kona. It's just bizarre. Then uh, honestly, you put that race in Florida. I'm in Florida, and I bet you Gustav runs under two thirty, pushed. It's it's unreal what these guys are running off the bike. It really is. But again, you see, you go to a different course like St. George. That's why I liked it because it it changed things up. The run was was just as hard. The the bike course was harder. It was windier. It was a different temperature. Right, it's dry heat, not humidity. Um, change is good, you know. Um, but yeah, it was awesome. I still got bed sores from sitting on my ass so much on Thursday and uh, and Saturday watching all the all the coverage. Mm. When I was growing, it's funny that quickly the secret sauce topic, when I was growing up and playing all different sports, there was one mantra that always stood true. And it was, if you want to get better, play against better competition. And what you're saying with Eden and Blumenfeld, like to me that, you know, nothing is a secret out there in, as far as technology, you know, so there's so much stuff, but the reality is, if you're serious about getting better in the sport, I think you have to figure out and find somebody that's going to push you, uh, you know, like on a daily, you know, like a, somebody, or, you know, I always talk about, I like, I used to like to run with runners and bike with cyclists and, you know, that kind of stuff where I, you just kind of just get better by being with them and stuff. And I think that's a very great point. I mean, you can have all these secrets you want in the world, but if you're not like, seeing yourself rise to the occasion against better competition, you're just not going to get better. I mean, to your, the, you know, your ideal fantasy goal. It's and there's, there's two different scenarios this day and age for, for age group athletes. And I had this exact conversation with the, with the two ends of the spectrum earlier this week, I had a, a woman training for, um, 70.3 worlds. And she said, Hey, I can, I can do your ride. 
Uh, but there's this group of guys that's riding outside and we can still ride outside here. She's in Canada. She's like, I can still ride outside here. Um, and, and they'll, they'll push me. They'll just demolish me, but I can always hang, you know, should I do that or should I do the indoor? I said, go hang, mm-hmm. you know, go outside, be pushed. Right. Cause pushing in a group is always takes less effort than to push solo on a bike trainer. <laughs> right. Like it just does. You know, it, it's like, it's like the same thing as like running in a treadmill. Your RP is always higher than it is running outside. And then I had the, a different conversation with another athlete. And I said, I'm all for you running with the group or running with your, your buddies, but your buddies are slowing you down. Your, mm. your buddies are, you're, you're caving into the, I want to walk most of this, not run. I don't want to do the intervals. I just want to ride. And, and I, and I'm fine with the connection piece and, and whatever makes you happy. But at some point, if you want to choose, perf, you know, to perform better and get faster, then at some point you have to say that, you know, I need to find faster or I do do more stuff on my own because, you know, a, a lot of, a lot of people, and this is, this is true of human beings in general, right? We, we gravitate, we, we rarely ever gravitate towards people or groups that are going to challenge us. We gravitate towards groups that make things feel easy that are the same i can be comfortable right like it's 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 our society in a nutshell right you got the red you got the the right you got the left you got the black you got the white everything is no one wants to talk to each other it's all about you know i I don't want to talk to anybody that can maybe you know expand my horizons or my thought process or my philosophy or the way that i see the world or the people that live in it i just want to surround myself with the same people i want to watch CNN 24 seven. And I want to watch Fox news 24 seven. You know, you're not learning Jack. You know, I saw uh, an interesting, uh, I'm not a big meme, meme guy, but this is, and this is totally like way off. But um, I saw a meme the other day. I said, CNN and Fox news are doing to our parents. What they always told us rap music and video games would do to us. <laughs> um, it's, it's just true. Like the obsession yeah. with the news on, on, on all sides, but that's just, it's again, that's just mentally, emotionally, and physically, we have become like almost allergic and afraid to put ourselves in a situation that might challenge us, challenge us to talk to new people, challenge us to think differently. I mean, challenge in general has become, again, let's lower the bar and let's lower the standard. Let's just go places where we can all get first. Right. And we're, and everyone's, it's like, that's, it's not how the world works. Right. The world isn't fair. Life isn't fair. And the, the illusion that it is fair is unfair because it's setting people up for failure. And I just think that, you know, when you, you, everyone should have a, a, you know, a core group of people in their life, both in life and in training. That's what I do with a coach. I texted a guy earlier. I said, who keeps fucking around with his bike fit. And I said, stop messing with your bike fit. Go get it professionally done and stop screwing around. You know, you've changed it six times at home in your garage in the last eight weeks and you wonder why you're uncomfortable. Like everyone needs people in their life that will call, tell them like it is and also give them a pat on the back. You don't need, you don't need a person that will just do one or just do the other. You need, you, know, you need people that will give you both because at least, you know, they're being honest. And that, that's what you need in training too, people that will keep you honest, not just, you know, make things enjoyable all the time. Sure. Once a week, sure. Go for it. You know, but every day you're going to come the same speed as your, as another person's dreams. And if you want to get faster, push yourself or find people to help push you. Take the hill. Exactly. You know, <laughs> Thank you. Take, on the way home, just take a, the hill. Of, yeah. And take you should tell that guy, hill. ask if he's uh, experimented with the tabletop fit. <laughs> Cause <laughs> that thing has got me intrigued. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, Laidlaw, was it just me or was he sitting high and flat? He, I, he, I don't know, man. Everyone's got such a different, a different, uh, you know, and you saw this a lot watching Challenge Day Clash, Daytona, when they did those races and people cared. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, how different the bike fits were and how aggressive some people were and then how just like – do to do to do like Paula Finlay. People saw her when she crushed it that day. And she was, she was like tabletopping it, sitting up. Yeah. But then she got off and ran through the field, 
You know, you saw the same thing with Reef. Reef sitting up tabletop, you know, crushed the bike split. You know, you saw the same thing with some of the guys tabletop in it. You know, it's it's really isn't, but it also goes to show you that, you know, your bike fit in how airy you are means jack if you can't run off of it. Right. Um, know. You know, it's just, it's, uh, yeah, it's it's an interesting, that's why your bike fits are so personal. It depends on the bike, depends on your flexibility, depends on your goals, depends on your power, depends on the distance you're racing, um, depends on what your strengths are. You know, because some of those guys, they got to be uber aero because their only chance is to come off eight minutes ahead. Because no matter what they're doing, they're 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 going to be they're going to be getting caught probably on the run. You know, so they they got to you got to gain every minute or two they can on the bike because you know an extra couple centimeters here of a closed angle or, or elbows, you know, closer in versus wide, you know, th- that 30 minutes that it gains them isn't going to affect their, their running because their running's already their running. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, it's, it's really interesting to watch, um, to watch all of them. And then like to see like the, <laughs> the stack height on these like super shoes, they're like, like they're like stilled in foam stilettos. I mean, they're like the 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 stack high. I think Gustav Eden came across the tape at like seven foot three because the <laughs> I know. the the stack height on those things were so giant. I mean, it really is unreal. Um, how much faster the the shoes I think are, are are making people. Yeah, people are getting faster, but the shoes are are making people just ridiculously. Faster, and that's like one of the things I've had to start bringing up. And and God, we're way over time here. Uh, in in training in peaks and running, is you see people running and like athletes, and you have to ask them like, is this a good run, or did you put on your fasties? <laughs> because like, you've been running eight thirties at this pace, and then today you ran you know seven fifty fives. Did you give it a little? You know, did you give it the the business today, or did you throw on your your fast shoes for a little zone two run? You're like, hey, I have to own the fast shoes. And you're like, all right, good. Okay, I'm not good, but it, it lets me know. It's just it's it's more important than people think. Uh, you know, notifying you know your coach when you're running your fast shoes or not because they might see you like, oh, they are they they're ready for a new block. They're they're absorbing this great. And the reality is is you went and dropped three hundred eighty-five dollars on some, you know, shitty alpha flies and ran a fast two miles. Doesn't mean you can run run those same things like for an hour and forty-five. Which mm-hmm. again, you saw that in the men's race that they're in the women's race. They're people are moving towards A6 and Saucony. They're they're moving away from those that trash uh, Nike alpha fly. Interesting. Yeah, and if you could forward this podcast from Mike and I to Andrew Messick the CEO of Iron Man and see if we can get <laughs> and I on. We'd be happy to do a, uh, a, an audition at 70.3 worlds, uh, later here in October. Um, as long as they, you know, we, you know, what we could do is like, we could get the Madden bus cause we're not flying. We get the Madden, bus, the Madden bus for any, anywhere in the country. Cause he was afraid of flying and that's why he got the bus. Um, is we get the we get the Madden bus to transport us around to the you know to the North American races and then all we need is like a Madden cruise ship right Just bus us to Cali <laughs> ship you know ship us on a cruise ship to Hawaii you know maybe two weeks early um, and we'll take care of it we'll take care of it and I guarantee you we increase viewership that's all I'm saying I'll even I'll pay you a thousand dollars to let me do it. Yeah, and if they don't, maybe we could just watch it and do our our own live stream as a tryout. We we would they would lose so much money because their viewership would 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 crumble. Maybe I'll do that. <laughs> well, Maybe we'll yeah. do that next year. I'll, I'll soak up like you know I'm gonna do a live YouTube commentating stream of both the women's and men's race and commentate the entire time. Yeah, I'll do that with you. I'll be like pass the chips, dude. <laughs> yes, sir. I mean it's <laughs> and and if you heard, I mean obviously you're listening to this podcast, but I got a whole lot to say about it. Like I I love watching the the pro race and I actually keep up with it versus the people they had they hire to commentate on there that say the same thing. And and you, I'm not saying Morton move ever. Or <laughs> I'm not gonna talk about Hoka's or Gatorade Endurance or What about Vinny about other crap? What about Vinfast? I had to look that Vin up fast. halfway through the thing. I'm like, what is this? It's a car. I tell you, it's it's like, a scooter. What are we even doing here? Yeah, we we don't do sponsors, we don't do ads, so that, that's how our base, that's how our our uh, stream's going to be next year. Maybe we'll charge ninety nine cents for you guys to come in on a on a, uh, a share screen Zoom call, make a few extra dollars. That's it. That's all we got. Hope you've been, uh, hope you've <laughs> enjoyed it. today's uh, roundabout uh, overview 
and discussion of the Ironman World Championships. Uh, as always, we appreciate you. I hope you tuned in and enjoyed the coverage last week. If you didn't, uh, I think you can find it online on a wide uh, range of platforms. Um, as always, go to our website, c26triathlon.com. It's our one-stop shop for all things coaching, camps, and community. We do. We will be launching our training plan uh, package for select races um, coming up on November 1st and also announcing our Ironman Wisconsin and Wisconsin 70.3 uh, camp info. We'll have that all out next week. Uh, registration will uh, go live for those early registra- re- registrants on the 27th, I think. And then everyone can uh, sign up starting November 1st. We'll have more details on that uh, coming up in other podcasts, but it's also on the front page of our website. Uh, and you can go there and check out more info on that. And as always, if you need to get a hold of Mike, he's at crushingiron at gmail.com. And I'm available at c26coach at gmail.com. All right, my man. Have a nice insight. Check it. Check it later. <laughs> See you.